Kingsmill, the growth of renewables, uh, principally wind and solar, has been exponential over the years. We keep hearing that exponential. Could you explain what exponential growth is? <laughs> so, so it, it, exponential growth simply means that you um, c continue at a at a constant um, growth rate um, over time, and and it's come to mean that, that needs to be a high growth rate. Um, in order to be um, sufficiently material and get people excited. So um, the the glory of solar is that solar deployment and electricity generation from solar has been doubling every three years for about 30 years. And now that it's close, n n nearly 10% of the system, I mean, you know, you can go do the maths. It's not, <laughs> it's, if you carry on doubling, um, we're not actually that far away from um, solar supplying all the system. Now, of course, it, you know, things do slow down over time. Um, and so I, I, we, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to continue to double for the next 20 years, every three years. But um, nevertheless, it's got an incredibly powerful momentum. And that's the glory of exponential change. Let's talk about uh, growth versus uh, current demand. And uh, you've made this point to me many times, is that the new technology first takes all the demand growth, and then it begins to, uh, the incumbent technology then begins to eventually decline as it gets pushed out of the market by the new. And it would seem that uh, wind, but particularly solar, uh, is doing exactly that. Yeah, so the, the the maths is incredibly simple. You've got a uh, you have a you have a system which has got inside it um, a, a fast growing exponential. So the electricity system is thirty thousand terawatt hours. It grows around three percent a year. So three percent of thirty thousand nine hundred terawatt hours of growth. Solar and wind are about five thousand terawatt hours a year, growing at around twenty percent at the moment. Twenty percent of five thousand is a thousand. So you know there you go. Um, just from those n numbers that one could do off the top of one's head, um, these technologies are growing rapidly enough, even when they're only about 20% of the system, already to be supplying all of the growth in the entire system. Um, and, and again, the point to me is because solar, as I was saying, is doubling once every three years and, and wind is also growing, then if you do the maths again in 2030, then there's no chance of any... Um, fossil fuel electricity demand growth, even if electricity demand growth goes up to uh, above 4%, simply because of the growth rate. When, when the growth rate of the new is is fast enough, it can easily swamp growth in the entire system. And that's the exciting moment at the moment, Mark. And we kind of, at this moment, um, n now where indisputably these technologies are, are supplying uh, all, all, all of the growth in total. But it's going to be a bumpy plateau. I think it's the other point we... We on our side of the fence possibly failed to communicate well enough to the general public is, you know, it, in retrospect, it's smooth. But at the time, you know, you have things like the outage of French nuclear, the outage of Chinese hydro, you know, 100 terawatt hours here, 100 terawatt hours there. They do, they do make a difference um, on a month to month basis or, or, or weather patterns, but nothing can stand in the way of exponential growth. Let's talk about the uh role of renewables in the global south because um i read a lot of oil demand oil and gas demand modeling studies and opec in particular has said very clearly that the technology we're talking about will never be economic and it will have to be subsidized by government and governments are getting tired of subsidizing it and so they have assumed that the global south uh, will stick with uh, oil and gas well past uh, 2050. Even in the last two or three years, we've seen that assumption be blown apart. I mean, it's, it's been disproved. Uh, maybe you could talk about that. Sure, this is hugely significant. Precisely as you say, um, one of the core OPEC arguments, one of the core fossil arguments is that the, the good folk of the emerging markets or, or, or the global south um, have low levels of energy demand per person that will increase and it they will do what we did and they'll copy us and they'll use more fossil fuels and and the problem is this is simply not happening and the reason it's not happening is because china is setting a different path and to put this in very concrete terms if you're looking at um for example um demand for oil per person per annum. Um, 
the 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 US gets is around 16 barrels of oil per person china has peaked at two and is falling the the rest of the global south is not i'm afraid going to take the us path it's going to take the china path and therefore they're going to compete at, at almost 10 10 times lower than opec was expecting that they would do and the reason they're doing this um is not because of their um not necessarily i should say because of their concerns about global warming or anything else it's just because they want cheap local energy and and now that you can buy electric vehicles chinese electric vehicles at ten thousand dollars um right across the global south that's what people are doing and that's why we're already seeing um the most amazing numbers like um there's leapfrogs going on all across the global south um where, where they're leapfrogging uh what's going on in in in, in the u.s for example and so you know, for example in 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 of, of imports, you have these famous numbers. The New York Times talks about of of seventy eighty percent of of imports in in places like Nepal being of electric vehicles. But if, if you look at even its sales value sales numbers in this like Vietnam, it's twenty twenty five percent of of cars are being sold are electric. And yeah, it's it's just a very different world that's being built in the emerging markets. Be and why they're doing it because they want cheap local energy. They don't want to be um subject to to buying uh billions of dollars of imported oil every month i think opec and others uh in the west have miscalculated underestimated the effect of uh, the china model because china very strategically has scaled up uh renewables on the supply side on wind and solar and, and battery storage and then scaled up at the same time deployment on yes. the demand side yes and and now china is moving that model out into the global south by exporting its technology yep. by setting up local plants by helping to finance uh you know exports and infrastructure development and i think i my hypothesis here is that 10 15 20 years from from now we're going to discover that China is the energy giant because it has formed these relationships and other uh, global South countries have essentially copied what it's doing. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not even 10, 20 years, it's right now. Um, I mean, you, you today have now, um, uh, you, you, you have people from the, from, from the US showing up in, in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, and trying to bully people into buying expensive LNG and, the, the the next morning, the, uh, the the Chinese attaché phones up and says, "Yeah, you can have um, these solar panels at, at rock bottom prices, and we'll finance it. Um, and once you've got it, you've got it for thirty years. How about that for a deal?" And you know what's happening is uh, that, that that right across the um, the emerging markets, people are taking the China deal because it's better. Um, and and what we're seeing, therefore, is we're seeing a uh, an electrification leapfrog in China adjacent countries, and that was really brought home in the about three weeks ago when the IEA released the 2023 data um, for electrification. This is a bit it's a bit late, but anyway, it, the the um, ASEAN leapfrog had leapfrogged the United States to U US about 21 percent um, electricity share of. Uh, 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 final demand and ASEAN leaped 22 percent but the point is that ASEAN is growing at 10 percentage points per decade so they're heading they're heading for the 30 percent and the U.S. sadly has been stagnant at, at um at about 20 21 percent for 15 years last question and this would seem to me I think this is emerging as a major issue in the global south and that is the advantage of uh, that uh, solar and batteries in particular are uh, can be distributed on a small scale. They can be put on your roof. They can be put on your balcony. They can be adopted by factories and you know businesses and commercial uh, enterprises. And what would be the what's the role of distributed versus utility in your opinion? Well, I mean, and again, like the Pakistan, of course, is the, the poster child of what's been happening here. Is if you had a um, a very poorly run, it would appear um, a central distribution system. And um, selling a very expensive electricity based on um, guaranteed contracts um, for, for for coal, and then people were able to get hold of their own um, solar panels from China and just stick them on their own roofs and their own gardens, and you know just lay them on the ground, even in some instances. And and suddenly that distributed solar was able to blow out of the water um, the expensive 
uh, incumbent model. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. So, you know, we in Ember, for example, put out my colleague Dave Jones, a very interesting piece that um, African solar imports have increased by 60% in the last 12 months. And that's not in the official stats. Um, sorry, that's not in the official stats for deployment, but it's in the official stats for Chinese exports. Um, and, and and if you then if you if you then look at satellites, you're seeing this stuff just being deployed all over the place. So there there is an incredible story of of, of locally generated solar. There's two other points I think worth making. First of all, the global south has an amazing advantage that you know we folks, particularly we folks in Britain, just don't have, um, which is just much closer to the equator. Um, and and that means you're not getting the the seasonal um, issues that we have in you know far, farther northern latitudes uh, for the uh, for, for for solar coming in. So you you can get we my my colleague um, uh, Annie did a very interesting piece recently. You can basically get about fifty percent um, of you can get fifty percent of your electricity from solar plus a small amount of batteries, get considerably cheaper. Um, then uh, the fossil fuel turned to around $60 per uh, megawatt hour right now, all across the global south. And then the final point then is that batteries are now coming into this mix. So as more and more batteries come in, you know, the the batteries are not good for interseasonal storage. In fact, they can't do it at all, but they're very good for overnight storage um, and, and 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 shaving off the duck curve. And you know, right across the global south, the the kind of problems that the that, that people were worried about um, uh, 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 three or four years or five or six years ago just uh, just being sold by solar plus batteries.